We're grateful for your presence today. We do have several of our regular folks out. We pray for their safe journey and their safe return. We're grateful for our visitors and trust the things that are done here will be uplifting to you and your understanding of primitive, pure New Testament Christianity. If you have any questions or comments about what we believe, what we do, what we practice, we'll be glad to receive them. It is our obligation to be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that is within us with meekness and fear. That's an obligation that is a part of being faithful members of the church to so do. And thus we welcome your investigation of the Lord's church in the light of what the Bible teaches. Many weeks ago I started the lesson that's been under the general heading of the Word of Reconciliation. Today I would like to bring that series to an end. And I'll begin as I have through most of those by reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning in verse 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In this last lesson, we want to deal with the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, concerning Jesus. For he is our peace, the apostle pen, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, meaning between Jew and Gentile, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is hate, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, that is, of Jews and Gentiles, one new man, so making peace. The world strives every way possible, according to the ingenuity of man, to find peace among men. There's really only one way, always has been, that men find the peace that is really lasting and beneficial and true, and that is through all men being in subjection to the will of heaven. And especially is this true now that the fullness of the gospels on this earth and has been for almost 2,000 years. The real peace we find is knowing that we have been reconciled to God for our belief and obedience to the gospel, that we are God's faithful children. If we will then put into practice the truth of the gospel concerning Christian living, then we will be what we ought to be to everybody else, and we'll be putting away envies and jealousies and strifes and all such things, and we will know the peace that God ordains that all have, but they can't have it outside of the gospel system. God, in the development of His gracious purpose, which is to redeem man, separated the Jewish people from the balance of the world. And this was done not for the good alone of the people thus called out, but for the good of mankind in general. The law, as Paul wrote, contained in ordinances is described as a middle wall or partition between Jew and Gentile. Now the Old Testament prophets clearly show that while the Redeemer, so far as humanity was concerned, according to the flesh, was to be of Jewish descent, his message was to bless the entire human race. Back in the days of patriarchy, such a scene in the age-old promise made to Abraham 
that through his seed singular should all nations of the earth be blessed. Paul even makes to the Galatian churches an argument based upon the singularity of that seed. He says, not into seeds, plural, but of seed, which is one. Those things which separated Jews and Gentiles were then to be removed. And both were to be brought together on perfect equality in one spiritual body of which Jesus Christ was the head. Now when Jesus came, both classes had become alienated from God. If you read the first three chapters of Paul's letter to the Romans, you will see where he points out the Gentiles desired not to retain God in their knowledge and thus did as they pleased. God gave them up. But then when you come over to the second chapter, he reminds the Jews that you had received the ordinances, you had special privileges, and yet you didn't keep them. And so when you get to Romans 3, he concludes all under sin. Verse 23, all in need of Jesus Christ and his gospel. So the purpose of Jesus was to reconcile both. And this was to be done in one body. Now, when you look round about you, at most people who claim Jesus is their Savior, they don't put any stock in the church as to it having anything to do with the salvation of man. That is the denominational concept of the church. And that's a shame because it's clear from any cursory reading of the New Testament dealing with the church that it all figured in to the divine scheme of things and the salvation of man. And here we see a man is reconciled, all men, Jew and Gentile, reconciled to God in one body by the cross. That is, Jesus purchased the church with his blood when he shed that blood on Calvary's cross, Acts 20 and verse 28. In verse 16 of Ephesians 2, Paul continues and says, and that he might reconcile both unto God. Remember the word of reconciliation, the gospel, draws us to God, reconciles us to God, in that as we believe and obey it, we are baptized to Christ for unto the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, uh, having slain the enmity thereby. In other words, he destroys the hate between peoples because they all love God and keep his commandments and thus adopt the view that God would have all men have toward one another, that they're all made in the image of God, all in need of salvation, all receive that salvation through the word of reconciliation, which is the gospel, God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. This one body in which Jews and Gentiles alike were to be reconciled then is the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18. And in this same letter in the first chapter, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul said, speaking of Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Now again, in the denominational world, they'll make a difference between the body of Christ and the church of Christ. But here we learn from inspiration the church is the body, and the body is the church. So who am I to contradict God? It's obvious then the institution of the saved is referred to by different terms for the express purpose of causing us to understand better what that institution is. After Jesus took out of the way the middle wall of partition, the law of Moses, which separated between Jews and Gentiles, then, of course, there is the establishment of the church, of which we read and have studied even in this series on the Word of Reconciliation, Acts chapter 2. The first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Jerusalem, the church of our Lord was begun. But we see then the two classes were not Jews and Gentiles any longer, but the saved and the unsaved. Now that's all there is in the world as far as men accountable to God for their actions. It's the saved and the unsaved. Today, anybody here that's old enough to know his responsibility to God, to understand sin separated from God, then you're either saved by Christ through the gospel or you're unsaved. It's just that way. So the church and the world is what exists today. 
The world being those who still live on the level of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that's all they think about, the here and now. And those who've heard the gospel call and are using their time here on earth of the flesh to get ready for that day that we all must face when we step over into eternity at death. Unless, of course, our Lord returns first, in which there will be a radical change at the end of time. Jews and Gentiles in the world sustain the same spiritual relationship to God, and so of those in the church. At first, the Jews thought the gospel, and you'll remember from our study we emphasized this, was for them alone, but it was made clear to them, no, the gospel is for Jew and Gentile alike. And it took a while for some to see this, but then revelation was made, and the apostle Peter had revealed to him to go to this uncircumcised Gentile's house, Cornelius, and preach the gospel to Cornelius and his household. The same gospel he preached on Pentecost, and at other times, the only gospel there is, that Jesus commissioned the church to carry and to preach to every creature, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we have in the divine volume. So Peter concluded in Acts 10, where we have Luke's account of the same, that God's no respecter of persons. But every man that will obey the Lord, will work righteousness, is accepted of him. The word of reconciliation, the gospel of Christ, committed to, through, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the ambassadors of Christ, the apostles, when complied with, did one thing. It saved men from their sins. And at the same time brought them into the church. Acts 2.47 makes it clear that such is the case. Luke says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Well, who should be saved? Well, you read back earlier and you see it's people that heard the gospel and understood it. Received the evidence in that gospel that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, which he declared... In John 14 and verse 6, they understood that, whether Jew or Gentile, but on the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church, that's what they understood. And we find that having understood it, recognized the truth that they were sinners, that sins that transgressed the law, that all transgressed it, though they were devout religious people, and they recognized they were lost through their understanding of the truth. And as believers in the Christ, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told as believers to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for or unto the remission or forgiveness of their sins. Acts 2, 37 and 38. And these who did that were added to the church by the Lord himself. Now the American Standard Version renders this last clause in Acts 2, 47. Those that were being saved. Well, those that were being saved were those that heard the truth, believed it, and obeyed it in being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3 and verse 27 in Acts 2.38. The process then by which people were and are saved, that is reconciled to God, was the process by which they were added to the church. It was in the days of the apostles, so it was. It is today the same and will be till the end of time. There are no saved persons out of the Lord's church. There are no unsaved persons in it insofar as alien sinners never became Christians. There may be members of the church who are living in sin and need to repent, but they're still members of the church. And they became members by hearing, believing, and from the heart obeying that gospel. So there are no unsaved people in the church. There are no saved people outside of the church. The denominational view is you believe in Jesus, you ask him to save you, and then you select which church which suits you best. You can't find that taught in your New Testament. It's just not there. And the New Testament is the will of Christ. The New Testament is the only place you can go to find out just exactly how Christ saves anybody and where he saves them. And he saves them, but he saves them in the church. Again, the process by which men are saved and added to the church of our Lord is the process by which they become Christians. 
the word Christian, Christian, one who is of Christ. You only find those who are truly scripturally of Christ in the church. Why? That's where Christ puts them. Now you remember that. When you obey from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivered you, being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 3, and 4. It's the Lord who puts you into his spiritual body, which is the church. He adds you to all the rest who have heard, believed, and obeyed the same gospel. There are no Christians then out of the church. There are none who are not Christians in the church. Now it makes the church pretty important. It makes the New Testament identifying marks of the Lord's church, which he purchased with his blood, which he built. So very important. I've often said, though not lately, people say you can't find the church. It's never been a problem for those who wanted to persecute the church to find it. And if those who hate it can find it, surely those who love the gospel and want to obey it can identify it by knowing their New Testament and understanding, if you please, the fingerprints of the body. If we can uh, know a person to be independent of all other persons by their fingerprints and other marks physical, then we can recognize the spiritual body of Christ, the church, the family of God through a proper knowledge of the New Testament. All the saved are in the church. All the reconciled are in the church. All Christians, as that term is used to find the New Testament, are in the church that Jesus built. The church is composed of Christians and Christians only and the only Christians. Listen to Acts 11.26 of the long ago beginning of things. And it came to pass that a whole year they, that is Paul and Barnabas, Assemble themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Again, Acts eleven twenty six. 26. Then later, Peter writing to Christians said, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The American Standard says, In this name. The very name that they want to make you ashamed of is the name God gave individually for the members of the church. And you should rejoice that you're able to suffer by wearing that name. He says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And, it first begin, and if it first begin with us, at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17. Indeed. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Obviously, since the gospel of God is the power of God to save, Romans 1.16, to save men from sin. And Jesus commissioned the church itself to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, beginning with the apostles, of course, Mark 16 and 15. Then the gospel is needful. And men can't become Christians who don't understand it. There are no Christians where the gospel has not been taught. Read what Paul said he taught to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. The us of 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17. The us and the term Christians are the same persons. Thus they, to use those two terms... Compose the house of God. 1 Timothy 3.15 That is the family of God. The house of God. The family of God. The church of God. The body of Christ. 1 Timothy 3.15 All those terms referring to the same institution. The institution of the saved that Jesus built. Now, when you study through your New Testament, you'll find in general that the word church has two applications. You can say three, but it falls under the second application, and you'll see why I said that a moment ago. But the two, two general usage are actually the universal church, the one church Jesus built that he promised to build in Matthew 16, 18. There's only one church worldwide. And then the church, as the term is used, such as the church at Spring or the church at Corinth or the church wherever. Now mark it. The church in any certain geographic location, such as this congregation of God's people right here, 
is the largest and smallest organized entity of the one church of our Lord. So you have the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus or the church at Jerusalem or the church at Antioch. In its universal sense, it includes all Christians. In its local sense, such as spring, it includes the Christians in that locality who assemble together to keep the ordinances that are set out in the particulars of the gospel of Christ. There's no way that the universal church could assemble in one place on the first day of the week. Impossibility. But we can assemble according to churches in certain locations. I want you to notice these scriptures concerning the universal church. The one church Christ built, to which he adds all the saved, and they're saved and they're baptized for the remission of sins. Remember, we said already when he was promising to build his church upon this rock, I will build my C-H-U-R-C-H singular, build my church. There's one universal church, Mark, as I say, Matthew 16, 18. And I learned from Paul's writing in Colossians 1, 18, as well as Ephesians, uh, that he says, and he, that is Christ, is the head of the body, the church. Then I learned, too, that Christ is the head of the church in this same letter, Ephesians, that we begin with, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. I learned, too, that the church is subject unto Christ, verse 24. That Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, verse 25. And that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Verse 27. I read from the letter to the Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 23 about the church to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. In the Greek, it's the firstborn ones. The following are a few of the many places where the word church is used in a restricted or local Geographic location since. You know, I pause here and point this out. You'll find in Romans 16, 16, no certain location mentioned. That is, geographic location. It just says the churches of Christ salute you. You'll find the church in a region such as Galatia. Thus, the churches of Galatia. So you can see the use of the word church in its local sense over and against the one church to which the Lord adds all those who believe and obey the gospel. So, in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, I read, they assemble themselves with the church. Now you can't do that, the church universal. It's impossible. In Acts 14, 23, ordained them elders in every church. Well, the word church there must be on a local level, because there's only one universal church, but he said in every church. Then I see in verse 27, had gathered the church together. The other verse was Acts 14, 23. I didn't mention it. So he gathered the church. Now I want to ask you, how would you gather the whole church together throughout the world? You couldn't. So it has to be that particular congregation in that locality. Greet the church that is in their house, Romans 16, 16, 5. Well, you'd have to have a mighty big house to have the church universal in it. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, thus the local sense. Now, there are the two ways that the church in general, the word church in general, is used in the New Testament. But now, when you look at the church, such as the church here at Spring. You'll find, too, the word church refers to the very assemblies. Remember when he's correcting the church at Corinth's abuse of the Lord's Supper, that he tells them when you come together in the church? Thus the word church is used to mean an assembly convened for religious reasons. So I see the church used, talk about the one body of Christ, then I see the largest and smallest organized entity of the universal body of Christ, and that is a church in a location. Then as a subheading in the church in a location, I see the word church used to refer to an assembly such as we're in even this morning. Now if I'm to rightly divide or handle right the word of truth of the study of the Bible, and I must if I do it like God said, 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, 
then I'm going to have to learn to notice the ways the words are used and the definition given to them. Because God's put His will in His Word. And if I don't understand those words as I use them then, I'm not going to understand the will of Christ. Jesus Christ is the only head of the church universal. And hence it's not an organization as that word is used with a human head. Christ doesn't sit in the Vatican in Rome and rule and his vicar's not there either. It's not constituted a branch church organizations but individuals make up the church each one of these enters in his own individual capacity everybody in this auditorium who's a member of the church individually and personally heard believed and obeyed the same gospel they knew it collectively they did it individually if you were preaching to thousands of people now and they all became christians every single solitary one of them Every individual would have to respond to the gospel invitation and obey the gospel. So each one of these enters in his own individual capacity, stands related to it individually, and is therefore a branch in himself, John 15, 5. Now the denominations have taken John 15, and where the Lord said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and tried to make the branches each denomination. But that's easily refuted because Christ didn't call those branches churches. He said, if a man. So the branches represent an individual person who hears and obeys the gospel. And they're one in the true vine, which is Christ. The church universal never acts as a whole. But what it does is a result of individual action in the local churches, the largest and smallest organized entity of the universal church. Organized as the New Testament sets out the organization, elders to oversee and deacons to serve and teachers and individual members and so forth. So a man secures membership as an individual capacity. And by the way, if he ever loses his membership, it'll be because he's become unfruitful or unfaithful and, and God has removed him, verse 2 of this passage. As has been shown, I believe, when we studied the different cases of conversion of the book of Acts, and we examined those in former lessons, persons became members simply by obedience to the gospel. That is, God adds them to the church via these means. Acts 2.47 and 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17. The church in the local sense, as I said a moment ago, really, when fully developed, has elders whose duty it is to oversee and guide the church in its work, Acts 20 and verse 28. To take care of the church, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 5. And to watch for the souls making up the church, Hebrews 13, 17. It can act as a whole, as in the cases of the church at Jerusalem, Joining with the apostles and sending messengers with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch, Acts 15.22. And the church in the city of Philippi and sending to the necessities of Paul while preaching the gospel, Philippians 4.15 and 16. Churches in different geographic locations can cooperate in any scriptural work as in the case of the churches of Macedonia in sending relief to the suffering Christians in Judea, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4. They can do this without one church running the affairs of another church. Simply by cooperation doesn't mean they disrespect the organization of the church or the autonomy of each congregation under the elders of that congregation. Now, if somebody's advocating something that says the spring church can run all the other churches in a certain area, then they're simply advocating false doctrine, and it would be wrong, and we ought to oppose it. But that's not what we're saying when we speak of the kind of cooperation the Scriptures itself brings out. The number of members of the local church may be large, may be small. You'll remember that the membership of the church in Jerusalem reached into the thousands. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, and my name means by my authority, there am I in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. 
two or three disciples with Jesus can constitute a local church. And yet thousands can also. To the local church is committed the duty of keeping the ordinances. Paul, in writing to the church in the city of Corinth, said, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Now let me ask you something. See, that comes from the New Testament of the Christ. And we're to do all according to the authority of Christ, Colossians 3, 17. Then why doesn't that statement apply to the spring congregation as much as it applied to the church in Corinth or any other congregation of God's people? To do this, they must meet together. In fact, that comes where he's correcting the church there for its abuse and misuse of the Lord's Supper in the assembly. So assembling as God directs is very important to being faithful to the church. We see that it's um, a sin to deliberately miss when you could be there the assemblies of the saints. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10.25 The exhortation comes in the assemblies of exhortation by the very acts of worship that go on in those assemblies. And we need that. It helps us be faithful throughout the week. So we need to be mindful of those assemblies. Locality and not the right hand of fellowship or some kind of human church letter gives membership in the local church. A church letter may make one favorably known, that is, from witnesses in that letter declaring what kind of life you've lived wherever you're coming from. But there's nothing like that in the scriptures that says this means by itself that you're faithful. It's just a means whereby we notify other folks of whatever we have been. You can see that in the fact that the apostles wouldn't immediately receive Saul of Tarsus in his newly converted state because they knew what he had been in Jerusalem persecuting the church. And it took Barnabas, whom they trusted, as well as his knowledge of Saul, to give evidence this man's really been converted. He is now one of us, not only a Christian, but an apostle of Christ. Well, you know, that's teaching us that we shouldn't just receive what anybody says about somebody, but we should, we should desire to know on the basis of evidence. The Christian who moves into the bounds of a bonds of a church has the privilege but a duty too of associating with that church as fully as though he had become obedient to the gospel through the preaching that was done by it there furthermore it's equally his duty to assist that church in his being individually faithful to God because it's the largest or smallest organized entity of which he's a part of the one universal church to which the Lord added him when he obeyed the gospel you cannot be faithful to the Lord as a Christian and be some sort of floater. You're faithful to the Lord according to the organization of the Lord's church, which we labored to point out throughout this lesson. Some people have the idea, well, I just won't be identified with any particular congregation. Well, you never got that idea from the teaching of the New Testament. I don't know where you got it, but it's not scriptural. People are expected to be faithful to the Lord and they can't do it and not be a member of a certain congregation. Now the Apostle Paul speaks to the church and I think this is marvelous. We bring the lesson down to a close. I wonder if we don't overlook this so much and learning to appreciate the church more and see it as God sees it as a glorious church. Why would he call the church a glorious church? Because it is indeed so. It is glorious on account of the blessings it confers. In it, persons have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ and thereby the forgiveness of sins. In it are reconciliation and there, those therein are a new creation in Christ. It is a glorious church because in its membership are the best of earth's people, men and women, boys and girls. We would do well to remember that when we think of the church 
especially when we're thinking of one another. It's a glorious church because of all its institutions. It has done the most to break the shackles that bind men to every kind of debasing ignorance and corruption and to exalt him to his proper place as a creature who is made in the very image of God and has been reconciled to God, forgiven of his sins, and once again, a faithful member of the family of God. It is glorious because of the foundation upon which the church is built, the grand world-redeeming truth that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. It is glorious because of the stability it keeps as long as it adheres faithfully to the truth of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. For over 1900 years it has stood as this great institution of the saved. While other great kingdoms and empires and nations have risen, they flourished different indefinite periods of time in power, and they passed away in time. But that's not so of the church of Christ. It is an impregnable rock. Against which the waves of infidelity. Of all manner of sin and corruption. Have dashed in vain. And it is a mightier force. Than the democratic or republican parties. Or any other political institution. It is glorious. On account of his great and matchless head, Jesus Christ. You know, nations are accounted glorious that have great and wise heads. Some are accounted glorious when there's not much wisdom in the head, but mainly foolishness. The church has for its head Jesus Christ. The only begotten Son of God. He stands far above the greatest of all earthly kings and emperors. Indeed, he is infinitely greater than all earthly potentates combined. It is glorious, that is, the church, on account of its future triumphs. The triumphs of the past certainly have been great. They will be greater in the future, ultimately at the end of time. They will be greater because the church will be delivered up to God by Christ himself. You can't get greater than that. Nor is there a greater hope than to be delivered up to the Father, reconciled to him. And I want to read this. We don't hear this kind of language much anymore. I wish we did, but we don't have anybody that reads or writes much anymore as they ought to, or at one time they did. And this writer said, finally, it is a glorious church on account of its ultimate destiny. When the ocean has wept herself dry, when the moon and the stars have fallen from their orbits, when the sun has burned himself out, when the earth has dissolved in smoke, when the dead have been raised and the judgment is passed, then will Jesus, as the head of the church, the king over this kingdom, deliver it up to God the Father, that he may be supreme. Glorious church. Thrice blessed is he who has citizenship in it. Now folks, when you feel like you're down and out and we've taken the church for granted, or we look at the foibles and the mistakes and weaknesses of our members, go back to the all-sustaining word of God. And learn to take the view that inspiration gives us of that glorious church. And realize that when you understand the church that Jesus built and what it was built for. And the whole scheme of redemption. The word of reconciliation means more and more to you every day that you live. And you'll be able to see then the church as God sees it. Don't you want to see the church as God sees it? Don't you want to see the church, you and I and all members of it, as God sees us? Well, you know, when God looks down to the faithful members, you know what He sees? Flawlessness. How does He see that? Because He sees the blood of Christ cleansing every faithful member of every single solitary sin. Do you think we've grown as we ought to grow spiritually when we can't see the church 
the way the Lord sees the church. Because those who are going to populate heaven are an assembly just like this, worshiping God today. Nobody else, only the saved and the church are going to populate heaven. And we ought to see it that way. Thus we see it in the eye of faith. And what our eyes of the mind can't see being ignorant of the truth. The enlightened mind, enlightened with the precious gospel of Christ, can see if we will but open our eyes, study the Bible, and view it all in the light of the divine volume. What a challenge that is, but what a blessing it is to all of us. If you're not a child of God this morning, you can be before you leave this building. By hearing and understanding the truth and having your faith in God based upon that truth, solely on that truth, Repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ as the Son of God, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. Now that's God's plan of salvation. It's how the word of reconciliation is presented to you. So if you from the heart will receive with meekness the engrafted word and obedience to the gospel, you'll be a part of this glorious church. And therein remain faithful until the end comes. And heaven will be your home. And that's where we all want to go. Is heaven. And rest. Finally. In the place we've all labored for. So if you're a child of God and you slip. Don't you think that's motive enough to make you be honest as you view yourself. And know whether you need to repent of your sins. Come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. That once again. We can arm in arm together in faithfulness to God. Enjoy the fellowship that God intends for all members to have. And someday be able to hear fall from the lips of our Lord. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in to the joys of thy Lord. Come to Jesus if you need. While we stand and sing.